like. Now, one, if, you are a, uh, if you've been saved, we're going to be raptured out. And if that happened today, that means we're going to be in heaven for seven years. We'll go through the Bema Seat of Christ. And we'll get our trophies, and or not our trophies, but our jewels, our crowns, and then we're going to be the bride, amen? We'll go through the marriage feast of the Lamb, and then Jesus comes back. With him, brings he, he brings his bride. So we're going to be coming. If it, the rapture took place today, we could be looking at this in seven years, okay? So just keep in mind, it could happen sooner than you think. Uh, maybe you don't know Jesus and you might make it through the tribulation if you, you know, I've, I've, I've told you, if you, if you see a lot of us just kind of vanish, it's not aliens, it's the rapture, okay? And if that be the case, then you need to find my notes. They're in my office. Uh, there, I find sermons on Revelation. It just says all sermons, and it gives the date. Now, you can read that and understand it, okay? Read that and live by it and get yourselves right and go to the Go to the Lord, okay? It's in my office, and then you've got this too. Start reading it like you, you've never read it before. That's the reason why I think victory, you know, faith is the victory when we have faith in what he says. Amen? That's a lot of ground breaking up. We've got a lot of visitors, and I've got to make sure we understand where we're coming from. Amen? Now, if we've got to that place and we've come back with Christ and we've got survivors and we see all those that are part of the first resurrection, point number two on the back of your board, and I filled in those notes for point one, so you've already got that. But what will it be like? What will it be like? And I, uh, I'll be honest with you, last week I was struggling with this and I was trying to really find a good good understanding of what that thousand-year kingdom would be like. And I really read this passage as a passage that led us to believe it would be what was happening during the new kingdom or the new earth and the new heaven. But as we get into this passage, we start seeing, uh, particularly in verse 20, and it says, and the center of a, of a hundred years will all be accursed. So that tells me that when we get to the new heaven and new earth, there'll be no sin. There'll be no presence of sin. There'll be no remembrance of sin. But during this thousand-year reign, we will see some of it. And it's going to be very minimal, but it will be there at the beginning anyway. But let's look at and Let's try to understand this a little better, what it'll be like. Unlike anything we've ever seen, I'll tell you that. Uh, the biggest part is that the darkness has been removed. You don't have the temptation that we have today. You don't have it in your face every time you turn around. And we're going to see that at the, the prophet Isaiah, he brings it out in a way that we can actually visualize and have hope of what it will be like. Now, we're going to have, those of us that will be raptured, we will have our glorified bodies. Uh, this is going to be for especially those that survived the, the great tribulation. They'll still have their human bodies. They will still have laws to be abided by uh, those that are part of the bride we're going to be there in jerusalem we're going to be ruling and reigning with christ amen so this is kind of a picture of what it's going to look like to us as we look out and how the world will be governed and how things will be different than they are today um it's almost like you're you're getting a foretaste in a movie what it's going to be like this is just all prophecy it hasn't happened yet but the best, I, you know, I'm praying that the Lord will fill in the blanks and paint the pictures and help you to understand so that we can look forward and glorify his name because he's done this for us and those that need another chance. Amen. But as we go to that passage that Cheryl read, and it is a beautiful picture, and we, we pick up at verse 17 in the chapter of chapter 65 of the book of Isaiah. Um, mark that in your Bibles because it... it, it in Revelation, we only see the 100-year the honeymoon is what I'm calling it, but the 100-year kingdom is all only three verses long. But if you go back to the Old Testament and the prophets, and we can see a better picture. So this chapter 65 gives us, first off, verses 17 through 19, we see that we can enjoy what God has created and no bad memories. I like that. I wish we could do that today, just like Cheryl said. The ways of the darkness have been removed. 
Uh, we don't see those, and, and they have also are going to be dealt with differently during this time. And there's going to be, instead of hatred and dissent, we're going to see happiness and joy. That's a quite a contrast of what we're used to. And I believe during the millennial reign that when, when Jesus is on the throne, goodness is going to prevail, not the darkness. And I believe that's important for us to look forward to in verses 17 through 19. saying, Behold, I create new heavens and new earth. And that means that he's going to clean up what we've got. That is not the new heaven and the new earth that we'll talk about in, in, a, in a couple chapters. Maybe the next chapter, I'm, I'm, but we get there. But here's the thing is, he's going to clean up this place. He's going to clean it up because it's, a lot of it has been destroyed during the Great Tribulation, but he's going to clean it up. He's going to clear the skies. We'll have fresh air. The pollution will be no more. Uh, we'll see that he has had made it all good, and, and he's going to also wipe the memories so that those things from the Great Tribulation don't weigh heavy on individuals. Can you imagine what it would be like to see some of the gross and the terrible things that the beast is going to do. How that in, in the town square we will see guillotines. And those who say, I will not worship the beast, I'm going to follow Jesus, they will have their heads cut off. Those are the things that they have witnessed, and it's good that he's going to clean their minds. Not only has he cleared the skies, cleared the ground, but he's going to clear our minds. And it's, it goes on, The former things shall not be remembered or come into mind, but be glad and rejoice forever. That which I create, not created, but what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy. You pick up any national, international paper today, is the story talking about Jerusalem going to be joy or is it going to be wars and rumors of wars? You see, that's the way we gear everything. It's the negative. It's how we're fighting against. And that's where Jesus, you know, when we think of Zion on earth, that's Jerusalem. And I believe that if we read this, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be gladness. People will be happy about what's happening in Jerusalem. you got to remember, Jesus is on the throne. We're going to be there helping to rule and reign. I believe the one that's going to be under Jesus helping him run might be King David. We don't know. But, I, you know, just listening and trying to think of what it'll be like. But it's going to be fair. It's going to be good. Nobody's going to be put down. Nobody's going to be... Uh, objected to as, as far as they keep God's word. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and crying and distress. It ain't been too awfully long ago that if you looked at a picture of Jerusalem, the background was all on fire. You remember all the fires and how they were having all the turmoil there? Uh, you've got all these, uh, the, the Arabs and all just, it's just a mess over there. That's going to be cleaned up. It's going to be a happy place. I hope you see that, and I hope you understand that. But not only that, but if we get to verse 20, we'll see that the age of people will go back to the times of Genesis, the first several chapters, and the age is like Methuselah. Now, how old was Methuselah? Uh, not, huh? It was 900 and something, exactly, 969 years old. Ray's trying to catch him. <laughs> I can pick on Ray's, my brother. But here's the thing, well, that's 90 you are, that's right. <laughs> Fourth of July. Fourth of July, you'll be 90 years old, amen. But here's the thing, when this kingdom comes to play, things are going to go back to that time, and if you're good and you do the things you're supposed to do, you'll live to be... You'll live through the whole millennial kingdom. You won't die. You will have the ability to enjoy life. We don't have the struggles. We don't have the constant darkness dragging us down. The constant uh, uh, opposition to good. We'll be able to live and be joy. And, you know, I learned a long time ago when I was a, 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 yeah, a manager in a manufacturing facility, the stress level that I lived was actually killing me. 
Then I become a preacher, and I turned lost hair and turned white haired, and I mean, it just all went crazy. I thought it'd be less straight. No, I'm just kidding. I'm happier now than I've ever been, but I just don't have all that darkness and uh, just the things that would push against me that would keep me out of church. We need you to work on this on Sunday, and I said, I'm not going to do it. And that's the fight that we have today and it was dragging me down because of the darkness and it was all about today and the almighty dollar instead of the kingdom that Jesus is going to bring and rule for a thousand years. You know what? We're not only going to be there, but we're going to be judges of those during that time. And I believe that something that as we read in verse 20, it says, No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days. Hallelujah. Be no more abortions. There'll be no more kids on the street trying to figure out how they're going to get their next meal. The pictures that you see on TV used to just really break my heart. You know, a child sitting in a sewer trying to dig out little pieces of food so they'd have something to put in their little belly. It'll all be in the past. We won't have that here anymore. It says, the old man who does uh, not fill out his days. You know, I, I, we just celebrated John going to heaven. John would have, he was 89. He'd have, been, he'd have been 90 July the 5th. And we considered him an old man. But there are people die every day. How many times do you pick up the paper and you see somebody 20-something years old that's been shot? Or somebody that because of the ways of the world today and the darkness that we have here, they've lost their way in life and they overdose in drugs. Do you see the powers of darkness and how they shorten life? I believe we have something to look forward to. And hallelujah, we don't, we, I look forward to those days to see a man that, that if he lives to be 900, you'll say, look at that man. He's just been good. He, God has blessed him. And we can go to them and learn and see and understand. And I believe that's something we've lost our way. My grandpa used to always say, you know, if somebody's there and they're old, you need to find out or learn something from them. And I used to just argue with him. He said, I'm learning in school. I'm learning from this person or that person. He says, nothing takes the place of what they saw before evil. And if you'll look at your life where you were born and as you grow, the evil is up, 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 up. And when they go back and you can look back, and I can remember even in my age, and I'm, I'm 61. I have to think about it. And I'm the youngin' of the bunch, some of you. <laughs> but I look back, and I can remember growing up, yeah, I used to skip school. Shame on me. But I skipped school to go hunting or because I'd been fishing all night or gone coon hunting, whatever. I mean, I shouldn't have missed school. I, I agree with that. But it wasn't because I was out tearing up the town. It wasn't because I was doing drugs. It wasn't because I was looking for darkness to get into. Times have changed. And I'm looking forward to the day we don't see that. And the verse goes on. It says, and the young man shall die a hundred years old. Now we're going to still see death there in a thousand years. But if somebody dies at a hundred years old, we will say, man, what a young person to die. But the next verse is what makes me know this is talking about the thousand year kingdom or the next sentence. It says, and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. You see, I, I've often wondered why Jesus is on the throne we're here to rule and reign and to be judges. Now, we're going to talk about the great white throne later, um, and I'll bring that up here in a second. But this, this hundred years, I believe that when you do wrong, it's going to be dealt with the way God intended to be dealt with. I believe you'll be brought before King Jesus or whoever, his, um, whoever he sets up to be the judge for that area. Now, I'm just... Going off of what the scripture says, it says at a hundred years, if he's a sinner at a hundred years, he will be accursed. That means he will pay the judgment. He will, he will have to answer for what he is doing or she. It's not going to be a smack on the hand. It's going to be what God intended. 
And you read the Old Testament and some of their laws and some of the things that were going on there, and you'll see that it can be pretty vivid at times. But we will see that sin and darkness, as it tries to come out, the leaders and the rulers of darkness are gone. But we still have people on planet Earth that have this sin-tainted flesh. Satan is in the bottomless pit. Amen? The world will be led in the right way because Jesus is on the throne. But we're still dealing with the flesh. And there will be those who will have that, that come out. God's going to deal with that. Amen? So let's get back to the happy stuff. In the next few verses, 21 through 22, we will enjoy working. Andy said that when he filled in for me last time. And I'm sitting there, I said, what? How many of y'all remember just enjoying work? Now, some of us do, did. I mean, it was give us something to do, and we had some things that we liked about it. But I'm talking about we will be eager to go to work. Now, think about the, the society of today. How many of you go to the restaurant and they don't have certain meals or they've had to be closed because people don't want to be servers? I mean, that's something we deal with today. But it says we. It, it says the labor, you know, it'll give you reward, not a paycheck, but you will do it because you want to do it, and you'll see more about this as we go on. Verse, start with verse twenty-one. It says, "And you shall build a house and inhabit them." Hallelujah! You're going to build your own houses, not you. Maybe those that survive, but they will build a house to live in. For that was the purpose. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build for another to inhabit and shall not plant for another to eat. Everything you do will be to live. Back in the old days, that's what it was. I remember going to a museum and I was, I, Jefferson Davis was a, a figure in the Civil War. Some of you know who he was, but I remember going to a, a museum in New Orleans and they had a suit that he was wearing uh, the the actual week that he he died, and this man couldn't have been that big around. And I was sitting there. I said, "Why were people so small in those days?" And here's what the the lady told me. She said, "You got to remember, back then they ate to live, and today we live to eat." And I said, "Okay, it all comes true now. I understand that now." But in the millennial king, what we grow, it will be for our tables. It would not be that we go and sell because we have to have money. We're going to build our houses. We're going to do things around our wherever we're at. And we're going to see that, that, that the food that is being produced in the garden is going to be eaten by the family in that house. Man, that's a change from what we see today. Because they get up, they want to do these things. I don't believe there's going to be manufacturing facilities. I believe people will have the means to take care of themselves. There may be stores. I don't know. It doesn't say anything about Walmart in here. <laughs> but, you know, it might be a community effort where that you go down the street like it used to be. Hey, brother such and such, I need some plates. I've got some bowls. Let's swap. And those type things, I don't know. I'm just trying to put the pieces together because it's so foreign from our way of thinking. They shall not build another in heaven. They shall not plant another in eat. They, they, uh, for the like of the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. My chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. I remember a day that it was good that mom would say we had a bucket on the back porch and she'd say go get the vegetables. And we knew that meant go out in the garden get some maters, cucumbers and all the whatever was ripe. And that's what we had for supper. She might throw some bologna or liver mush in there but that's what we ate. She worked in a textile mill and she didn't feel like doing a whole lot. When she got home she was tired. But she would have, you know, people would have joy during this time. Let's go on. You'll not work in vain, and kids will not live, and kids will live a wholesome life. That's something to think about. Things will move in the meaningful and purposeful way. We will see communities come together where they help one another. They'll help the children to understand. 
We used to do that. And Steve's real good when we talk about men's thing. He says, we need to get this. Uh, you know, he's, he brought out, let's, let's get Gavin. He needs to be involved with this. And he's right. We've lost our way in teaching our youngins, our grand youngins, the ways of life. Instead of just letting them learn street smarts. He goes on at 23. It says, they shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. Let's just stop there for a minute. If you look at the world today and what they call, you know, when we have children, and it says that, that it'll no longer be bear children for calamity, most children born today are because two people, man and a woman, uh, decide to have a fling. Uh, I need to have children. Uh, but it's not for the purpose that God. In the, in the garden, he said, reproduce, multiply, that my ways will multiply. If we would not have seen the darkness come on the scene, we'd have kids. And that if the, if the darkness hadn't happened in, in Genesis 3, we wouldn't have seen Cain and Abel get in the argument they had and Abel lose his life. They would have kept on and they would reproduce and they would have kept on and we would have a godly world. That was what God intended. That's what we're going to see here. People will have babies for the purpose of multiplying and replenishing the world. Amen? And that's what we should be doing. Not that we got a bunch of babies running around the house to do the chores, but that we can have somebody we can pour into and teach the ways of God, that they can have children and pour into and teach the ways of God. You see how this works? kind of sounds like discipleship, don't it? That's what we need to be doing. But it says that's not going to be anymore. It's not going to be calamity. It's going to be with purpose, and they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord. And their descendants with them. Amen. It's a process. And that's how we're going to see. We're going to see during this thousand year reign or kingdom, we're going to see a population explosion. We thought we've seen it in the last um, hundred years. But there's going to be a, a, just a massive growth of God's people. And we're going to see that later, we're going to see that some will find the darkness but I believe they're going to be way outnumbered, not like it is today. Going on to verse 24, he's going to answer our prayers even before we finish answer, asking the questions. I thought that was kind of cool. I can see um, in this verse it says, Behold, they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. I kind of see this as a picture of uh, that noonday time with God. You remember in the Garden of Eden when, when God came on the scene and Adam and Eve were hiding? And they, you know, it was the cool of the evening. They, were, they, they would spend this cool of the afternoon with God. And He would answer their questions and He would give them what they need. He may have, during that time, that might have been when He brought animals and said, Hey, Adam, what do you, what do you think we ought to call, call this? And He said, A platypus. It looks odd. I mean, we don't know what the conversation was, but when this time will be, I believe God will. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. And I believe we'll see that. And he says that before they, you know, they think it, and before they can ask it, he's already answered that prayer. Man, how many of y'all get to answered prayers like that? Amen. You do? Amen. I, I, I've seen it, but it's not the norm. Amen. Many of us ask and ask and ask because we ask amiss. Isn't that what James said? We pray and we ask amiss because we're doing it in our own strength, our own flesh, instead of the purpose of God. What is it that God wants? I think that'll be a great time. Even the nature of animals will be changed. We read in verse 25, The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. That would be odd looking, wouldn't it? The point is that there'll be death, no more death as far as the dark. Sin is the reason why animals fight each other. Sin is the reason why we don't get along with the lion today. Sin is the reason why we can't walk up to a tiger and pet him and say, Hi, kitty, 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 without losing a hand. But you see, and during that time, we'll see God's creation in all of its glory. And we'll be able to sit there and run with the big cats or go up to a bear 
say, hey, buddy, I want some of your honey. And he's, he'll say, step right in here. <laughs> we don't know. They might talk. They did. I believe they talked in the, the garden, and we can talk about that another day. But I believe that as we see these animals and we'll enjoy the creation, it's going to be a glorious place. And I keep referring to us. We will see. I pray that you'll be there. I pray that you'll have your glorified body. And even though we're there to rule and reign with Christ himself there in Jerusalem, I believe we are going to be able to enjoy this just as well. I believe we're going to see the glory of God as it's intended to be. And I thought it was kind of funny, not funny, but it goes that last little part, there's a comma, and it says, the dust shall be the serpent's food. And I thought, you know, that picture is still there, and the serpent is still going to be slithering. I believe that what darkness has done to this world, that God, you know, he forgives and he forgets when it comes to us. But when Lucifer did what he did, until he's in the lake of fire, he's not going to let it go. And that's the reminder that we will have right there, I believe. It goes on to say that the animals are all that. It said, they will not hurt or destroy in all of my holy mountain, says the Lord. Thousand-year honeymoon. It's going to be great, wouldn't you say? That's something to celebrate. Real quickly, point number three. In 2 Peter we read, and I'm not going to read the whole passage, but I want us to see that Peter even tells us in the New Testament some 2,000 years ago that we need to look forward to this time because it will be a purging. We've seen the darkness go away, and as we look forward to it, how should we be living today in relation to what God has prepared and going to do for us when that happens? The day of the Lord is very important when we speak of that, and this, this passage always, it, it also gives us that. But point number three is, why will it matter? Why will the thousand-year kingdom matter? Why is it important to us today? And Peter brings it out very clear. Um, we are we we got to see why it matters that we might change maybe the way we perceive or move forward with life. I want us to see that he promised us, and in verses verses three through seven we read about verse four where it is promised of his coming. We look forward to Christ coming back because it says the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is when he returns, not the rapture, but when he actually comes to earth. And he goes on, verse 7, it says, By the same word, the heavens of earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. We will see at the end of the thousand-year reign the great judgment, and that will be our next uh, uh, part of this series. We will see that they will be taken care of, and that will be purged by fire. Now, the earth in chapter 6 of the book of Genesis was destroyed by what? Water, the flood. And this verse, he also talks to us in that. In verse 6, it said, By the means of the world that, that, that did exist was deluged or submerged with water and perished. The ways of Genesis chapters 1 through 6, we see a lot of things happen. I believe they were very smart, and I've had conversations with people. They had a lot of technology back then, I think. But all that was wiped, and it was undone. And God said, I'm going to do it with fire next time around. But the other reason why it's so important that we look forward to this thousand-year reign, and, we, and you know, we, we, I was reading commentary, and I think I might have mentioned this last week, but somebody said, why does Jesus put Satan or loot uh, the dragon in the bottomless pit for a thousand years and let him loose? He says, well, you tell me why he let him go into the Garden of Eden, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why he does that. We don't know why God does things. And I don't want to get into a big theological discussion, but I believe that we have a heavenly realm where there's people or angels and darkness. And we, we read it in Scripture, the unseen realm. Me and Andy were talking about it last night. We don't understand, but he loved that. He created that just as he did human beings. 
And when the two come together and the, the thousand year reign, it's going to be a great time. But we have to understand that God has a purpose, and it's not always ours to know that. But I believe we have that to look forward to. And it's, but primarily, it's the very last chance for people to get saved. He's going to give them a thousand years to see that God's way is always the best way. That's the reason why the song we sing, faith is a victory. When we have faith in God's word and we understand his commandments because he's promises he's going to take care of us in order that we might glorify him. Even Jesus on his walk while he was in ministry here on earth for those three years in ministry, he always said, I do this to glorify the Father. When we look forward to the kingdom, the thousand year kingdom, we can tell people about it. Wasn't that what I asked you at the introduction? How much do you know about this thousand-year kingdom? Do you look forward to it? Do you realize what's going to happen? How darkness is not going to be here? How God's going to have his way in every matter? We're going to see another big fight between Satan. He's going to be loose for a little bit. And we're going to see, while we're here on this earth, ruling and reigning with Jesus in Jerusalem, we're going to see the Father step up and take care of something. I'll save that for that sermon. But we have this all to look forward to because it will be the very last chance that some will have. Everything will be exposed. Everything that's done on earth will be exposed. Everything that's wrong will be exposed. We will know right from wrong, and we will do the things that are called according to his will. And at the end of it, we will see the great white throne. We'll speak about that in a couple weeks. But I want to move to the last part of this passage, and it says it's just a foretaste of what we got to look forward to. As we read about this, we have to understand that when it's all said and done and we see the new heaven, and the new earth, capital ends and E's. We can't even imagine what it's going to be like. It's, it's, it's a glorious time. We're going to try to do that in a few weeks when we get to the last chapter. But in chapter 13, or uh, verses 11 through 13, we read this. It says, we're waiting for, and the hastening of the coming of God, do you look forward to the coming of the Messiah? Do you look forward to him calling us out of this place? Are you looking forward to his kingdom? If you can't answer yes to that, you need to get, just come and ask the questions. And let me take the Bible and show you so that you can know that you can know that you can know that I'm going to see Jesus. And if I get to the gates and he says, why should I let you in? I'll know the answer. If you can't answer that, you come and ask me. I've had a lot of people say, I hope I get in. I hope that I can go to heaven. I hope that my life's been good enough. This passage in 2 Peter tells us that we can know. 1 John 5, 13 says this. Write it down so you can go back and check me out. I've written these things to you that you may know that ye have salvation. Amen? I want you to know. But we can look forward to it and as, as we read in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart, heart of, of man imagined, that what God has prepared for those who love him. Do you love God and live today like you're already looking to the kingdom? I've tried to preach as hard as I can that the kingdom starts now. Amen. The kingdom starts because we have Christ in us through the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have the rules in our hands. The same rule book that will be used in the thousand year kingdom we hold in our hands. Right. Are you looking forward to that time? Can you imagine being a judge that will actually judge angels? an awesome responsibility but God gives us that ability and we can't even understand it we can't imagine what it's like Paul tried to give it to us but Isaiah said it like this in chapter 64 just the preceding chapter of where our text came today 
For of old no one has heard or perceived by the ear, no eye has seen a, a God besides you who acts for those who wait. And I've underlined that like four times for you. Are you waiting on the Lord? See, we got something to look forward to. Are you waiting for him? I can't wait to see Jesus. I can't wait to see what he's prepared. I can't wait to come back and see this old world cleaned up, beautified. And God sitting on, or Jesus sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, ruling. Oh, it's going to be a great time. I look forward to that. I hope you do too. So I'd ask a question. How much do you know about the thousand-year kingdom? My application is there on the bottom of your, your bulletin. And it says, now, knowing a little bit more, because I've just scratched the surface. You go back to the Old Testament and read the Old Testament prophets. Go back to the, the notes that if you were in Cheryl's Bible study, go back and I, I went back and looked at a few that she had wrote down some of these things looking forward to what's going to happen. And she did a good job. But trying to understand what it is, but knowing a little bit more, I need to start making better preparations. Not just waiting, but making preparations. Telling your loved ones, telling your neighbors, telling the, what you've learned what it's going to be like, and inviting as many as I can. I can't wait to get to heaven. But I can't wait to see what it would have been like if Satan hadn't showed up. I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus in, on the throne. We always talk about him being the king. I'm looking forward to that. And a thousand years, as and I didn't cover that, but in, in Second Peter there, that's where you read, a thousand years is as a day. And that's the reason why we have the day of the Lord. That thousand years of him being here, it's going to be great. And I hope you're ready. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your love. Thank you for the way you have just been so sweet to us. But Lord, we need to trust in Jesus more. We need to have more faith. We need to read your word with desire looking forward to what it is that you've prepared for us but before we can have an understanding of that let everybody that's here today through your holy spirit be drawn and understand that you sent your son to die on a cross that we might live to wash our sins away to give us a robe of righteousness to fill us with your holy spirit to give us the ability to understand your word so many things you've given us. You've been so gracious to us. Lord, let us hold those things dear. Let us hold them as truth and live a life today helping others to see Jesus through our lives. As Gavin and I were talking earlier, let us manifest you and all the greatness that you've given us in your word and through your Holy Spirit that others will be drawn, wanting to know more. And I pray that we would be the best lights that we can be. I thank you for what you're going to do. We ask this all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.